ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وبعد then the topic which is possibly one of the most important of the topics as it relates to the arena of the manhaj or the methodology and the arena of the sunnah and its clarification is the discussion in these times that revolves around the issue of the saved sect for indeed <coughs> we have with regard to the affair of the saved sect different types of inclinations and different types of opinions as it relates to the saved sect you have those who say don't speak about the saved sect and don't speak regarding the saved sect for the issue regarding and related to the saved sect it is not known except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so no one knows the descriptions of the firqatun najiyah no one knows the descriptions of the group that has that has been given salvation so therefore this that this issue of discussing or even entering into the discussion of the saved sect don't enter into it because it is something that is unknown and no one knows who the saved sect are so leave it alone altogether this is a bid'ah muhdatha this is a newly invented uh, inclination and an ideology that was not there in the time of our salaf then you have another inclination with regard to the saved sect and that is the claim of ahlul bid'a that they are the saved sect that they themselves that they are the saved sect and therefore uh, since they are the saved sect so they will claim it for themselves and regard everybody else who opposes them to be outside of it and in reality this claim of theirs is an empty claim because the reality of their aqeedah and the reality of their methodology shows something completely different and this is also a bid'a and then there is though and then there are those individuals and they say that we have recognized the methodology and the aqeedah of the saved sect we do not say that i or me or my friend that i am in jannah but rather i say to you that i have recognized and i have been shown the methodology of those individuals whom the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam described whom allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described and that methodology that they are upon that allah has described or the messenger has described and those companions were upon that is the saved sect i take to that methodology and i call others to take to that methodology that means that i don't say that i am in jannah what i say is that i have recognized the path that leads to jannah and the recognition of the path that leads to jannah only leaves me to strive upon that path and call others to strive with me to stick to that path and that is the path of the companions of allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is the position of the one who truly understands the methodology of the saved sect not the arrogant claim that people make and they say oh you salafis you say that you're in jannah no i don't say i'm in jannah like ibn abi mulaika rahimahullah ta'ala he mentions in the in the narration reported by imam al-bukhari in his sahih that he mentions that ibn abi mulaika said that i met such and such a number of the companions and i did not meet a single one of them except that he feared hypocrisy for himself so these are the ones that he's talking about who is he to, he's talking about the sahaba radiyallahu anhum that the companions of allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam who without doubt were upon the path of guidance and then upon the path of the saved sect that they themselves feared hypocrisy for themselves so the way of the one who who has found the straight path who has found the path of the saved sect 
then he is not the one who becomes arrogant and believes himself to be saved and believes himself that he already has gained entry into Jannah because the companions who are saved radiyallahu anhum wa radwan as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions was sabiqoon al-awwalun min al-muhajirin wal-ansar wal-ladhin attaba'uhum bi ihsan as Allah describes them with that the first and foremost to embrace Islam from the muhajirin and from the ansar means two groups of companions and then those who follow them in goodness radiyallahu anhum wa radwan that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. These companions of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who have been granted success by Allah and those who follow them in goodness have been granted success, they feared for themselves that they would not be gained that they would not gain entry into Jannah. They feared that for themselves because this was their humbleness and their sincerity and them always taking account of themselves. So the way of the saved sect is not to say that I am saved, not to claim that I am already in Jannah, but to say, and this is the, this is the manhaj that, 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 that the Salafi and the Sunni who understands this issue relate to the saved sect, that he gives this muqaddimah, that this discussion is not a discussion as many of the people claim, that this is a discussion of just you Salafis building yourselves up and claiming that you are already in Jannah. No. So therefore we give some sort of taqdeem or we give some sort of introduction to this affair. And we state that that which we are about to discuss does not in no way necessitate that I am saying that I am in Jannah. Nor does it necessitate that I say that everyone sitting here is in Jannah. But was, rather what it does necessitate is that the Salafi, Sunni, the one, who, the Athari, the one who is upon the Athar of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he recognizes the saved sect. He recognizes who's they, who they are. He recognizes their attributes and he strives upon that path to reach it. And I'll give you a similitude that will clearly make the thing apparent to you. That it is, it is like a person who, who is in the middle of a desert. Two people in the middle of a desert. And in the middle of the desert they are dying of thirst. No water. Then they come across some wells. And amongst those wells, the number of those wells numbers 73. Every single one of them, if you, look, if you were to look into it, you would say that there is water in there. However, your companion says to you that these 73 wells, I have seen over the last 10 odd years, people come and drink from these wells. And I have seen people who have drunk from these wells and they have died after drinking from their well. Because every single well is poisoned. Except that there is one well that I have seen people drink from. And when they drink from that well, their thirst is quenched. And then they carry on upon the path. I know which one that well is. So he says to his companion, I know which that well is. So the companion says to him, direct me to the well. So then he directs him to the well. He doesn't say, I am the well, drink from me. He doesn't say that. He says, I know which one is the well out of the 73 that is not poisoned. Because they all look the same. And they all, when you, if you were to take them out, the water out of them, the water all looks the same. Except that the one who drinks, then he perishes and dies due to the wells that have been poisoned. Except one of them. Now, which individual is going to take, his, take a risk? That he's in the middle of a desert. Which one is going to take the risk and not listen to the advice of the one who has been sitting there for the last 10 years? Or the last 15 years? Or 20 years? Or 30 years? And he tells him, this is the well. If you were to drink from it, you will not be poisoned. You will quench your thirst and then you can go upon your path. So this is the similitude of the Sunni, Salafi, Athari, upon the Athar of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He doesn't claim that I am the well. Take from me and you will be saved. No. He says that the well, I take from it. Here it is. You take from it with me. This is the muqaddimah to that which we are, which we are about to say, or the introduction and a, and, a, and, a, and a beginning to that which we are about to say. So don't take from anything that is said that we as Salafis, individually I claim that I am in Jannah. Or that I claim that any of you sitting here in Jannah. I do not know. I do not know. All I know is that that methodology which I call to. 
And that methodology which we take from the Salaf of this Ummah and the great Imams of this time who take in turn from the Salaf of this Ummah from the earliest generations beginning with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum up until this time that that is what I take from and that is what I call to and that is what I have certainty upon and that is why I ask Allah to accept from me as a means of gaining entry into Jannah not knowing whether my deeds are in accordance to my statements not knowing whether my speech is in accordance to that which is in my te- chest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best with regard to the difference between my deeds and my knowledge that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen so that every single one of us sitting here today that that which we know as compared to that which we act upon that there is a close proximity between the two that you don't know a whole heap and you act upon a little but rather as Aisha radiallahu anha said when a man came to her seeking knowledge when a young man came to her seeking knowledge she said, he said to her oh my mother because they are the, she is from the Ummuhatul Mu'mineen she is from the mothers of the believers he said oh my mother teach me something from ilm, from knowledge so she taught him something then he returned back later, a week later and, she's, and he said to her oh my mother teach me something he said no my son did you act upon that which I taught you he said no oh my mother I have not as of yet I haven't she said then why do you why do you insist on increasing the proof against me and against yourself for yawm al-qiyamah so therefore yes there is a there is that aspect that a person may know the straight path and he may have knowledge of the straight path he may have knowledge of the saved set but his actions in accordance to that which he knows may be deficient so therefore it is upon every single one who has an attri- who has an affiliation or an intisab towards Salafiya of claiming to be Salafi or Sunni that he does not allow that gap between that which he knows and that which he acts to become great because that would be hypocrisy in action not hypocrisy in the major sense but hypocrisy in action that you say something or you have knowledge of something and you're not and you're not acting upon that knowledge and this is not our way and this is not what we call to so the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that we recognize <coughs> first and foremost that the path of the saved sect or the path of Islam, let's just begin with Islam generally, that the path of Islam is a singular path. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how many religions did he come with? He came with one religion, not two, not three, not four, not with 73, not with 74, he came with one deen. And that is the deen that was sent to all of the prophets that came before him calling the people to the worship of Allah. وَلَقَدْ بَأَثْنَ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا التَّاغُوتِ That we did not send except a messenger to every single nation calling them to the worship of Allah and away from the worship of the false deities. This was the purpose of the sending of the prophets and the messengers to call the people to the worship of Allah. In that regard, our messenger Muhammad sallallahu was no different. Some of the rules and regulations related to the affairs of the ahkam of the deen, related to the regulation of the religion may have been different. Like the prophet sallallahu said in a hadith, when he said that indeed I have been given five things that no prophet before me was given. From those five things that the whole of the earth is a place of worship. And the whole of the earth is a place of purification. If you can't find water, you make tayammum. You, hit, you strike your hands on the ground, you wipe your hands, you blow your hands, you wipe your face. This is the, the, the tayammum. So you can purify yourselves even without water. Even without water. So the whole of the earth. No other prophet was given this before the messenger Muhammad sallallahu So some of the rules and regulations may have changed. But the aqidah, the tawheed, the, 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 the root and the, and the asal of the issue and the origin of the affair was the same. That they were called to an Allah That they were called to the worship of Allah to call the people to the worship of Allah and away from the worship of everybody or everything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was a singular religion. One religion. He didn't come with four madhabs. He didn't come with four madhabs. He came with one madhab. And one religion. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum that when they followed the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa they followed him precisely upon that which he, was, which he was upon. And his statement, the statement of the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam was the final statement in any affair. Without doubt. And that's why we find the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numerous in the Quran with regard to obedience to the messenger of Allah. 
أتي والله وأتي رسول وأولي الأمر منكم فإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله ورسوله إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions unconditional obedience for the messenger of Allah obey Allah and obey the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam obey Allah and obey the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and if you were to differ in any affair and, and, and those in authority amongst you and if you were to differ in any affair between yourselves then what? then take it back to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for final uh, in, in your differences if you truly believe in Allah and the last day and likewise the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذَنُوبَكُمْ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions say to them O Muhammad say to them if you truly love Allah then follow me then Allah will love you and then he will forgive you your sins so here the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear abundantly clear that the one to be followed amongst mankind and this is why some of the scholars call it the fourth level of Tawheed uh, not the Tawheed of Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq not the Tawheed of the Qutubiyya and the Sururiyya and, the, and Ahlul Bid'a and the Hizbiyun who claim that Tawheed is of four categories Tawheed al Rabbubi, Tawheed al Rabbubiyya we agree with them which is Ifradu Allahi bi Af'alihi to single out Allah along with his actions. And then they say the second level of Tawheed is the Tawheed of Al-Uluhiyya. Ifradu Allahi bi af'al al-ibad. To single out Allah alone with our actions. Then the third level of Tawheed which is Tawheed of affirming for a Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat. To affirm for Allah what Allah has affirmed for himself. Or what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has affirmed for him from names and attributes. Then they say there is a fourth level of Tawheed. The Tawheed of Hakimiyyah. The Tawheed, they say, the Tawheed of rulership and sovereignty. The Hakimiyyah is only for Allah. So this is the fourth level of Tawheed. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whomsoever does not judge what Allah has revealed, they are the kafirun. So therefore, this is the fourth level of Tawheed. This fourth level of Tawheed, to single it out as a fourth category, is a bid'ah. Innovation in the deen. And the ones who bring it, bring it from the aspect of takfir. And from the aspect of of the Khawarij and from the aspects of the renegades who have exited the Da'ira of Ahlul Sunnah who have exited the realms of the people of Sunnah and the Jama'ah none of the Salaf spoke with this and all of the Kibar al-Ulama and the major scholars of our times have refuted mentioning the fourth category of Tawheed as being Hakimiyyah there is no fourth category called Hakimiyyah but some of the scholars do mention that, the, that there is a Tawheed amongst mankind which is called the Tawheed al which is the Tawheed of singling out the Messenger of Allah alone to be followed. That if there's a, any human that is deserving of to be followed singularly without question, then that is Nabiyuna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our Messenger or our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, they, some, some of the ulama and some of the mashaykh, they call it the Tawheed of Al-Mutaba'a or the Tawheed of following him alone. That you don't put anybody else's speech amongst mankind over his speech. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in any of his speech and any of his statements and any of his actions, he never ever opposed that which was revealed in the kitab, in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because some of the, some of the people... Of, who have been affected by the ideas of the Mu'tazila and the modernists they claim that if you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and if you look at the Quran there is some ta'arud there is some uh, contradiction between the two and in reality a Shaykh Muhammad Aman al-Jami rahimahullah ta'ala from the Aimma of this Ummah who died approximately close on to two decades ago rahimahullah he mentions that the ta'arud or the, or the contradiction and the conflict is in their brain and in their feeble minds it is not a contradiction between that which the Prophet ﷺ said and that which Allah said. Because the Messenger of Allah ﷺ could never oppose and did never oppose what the Prophet what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said. And he never did so. So there is no contradiction between the words of Allah and the words of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. He said this is because they have not understood. They have not understood that the Tawheed, that the sorry, that the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ as it relates to the Qur'an, then it is of three types. 
as it relates to the Quran. There is the Sunnah which Sheikh Muhammad Aman Jami says, and, and he calls it the Sunnah al Muwafaqa, or the Sunnah which agrees with the Quran tamaman from every single angle. For example, that the Prophet, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran the obligation to pray. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions the obligation to pray. Any difference? Exactly the same. Then there is a second type of Sunnah, which is the Sunnah al Mubayyina. And this Sunnah, as the word uh, mentions, is to give tabiyin or to explain that which is in the Quran. So, for example, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran with regard to the prayer that a person should pray. And a person, as Allah mentions, that they make ruku and they make sajda. But the details of this prayer and the exact number of times that you pray in a day and the number of raka'at and the number of units in each of the prayers in Fajr, how many? Two. Mentioned in the Quran? No. It's not mentioned in the Quran. Dhuhr, how many? Four. Is it mentioned in the Quran? Not mentioned in the Quran. Asr, four. Maghrib, three. Isha, four. Likewise, the tahajjud and the number of, of, of raka'at that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to pray in the night prayer. Also the, the salawat, or rawatiba, or those, or those prayers which are from the, from, from the rawatib, or from those prayers that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did not miss, like the two before Fajr, and the four, and the, the four before, and the four or two after Dhuhr, and the two after Maghrib, and the two after Isha, and the Witr. These are not mentioned in the Quran. Rather, they are explained by the Messenger of Allah. Does that mean there's a contradiction between the Quran and the Sunnah? Because the Quran didn't mention it? No. It means that the Messenger of Allah is doing as he was informed. To make bayan and to clarify to the people. Manuzila alayhim as Allah, ilayhim as, the, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. That we have sent down to you the dhikr. Litubayyina linnas manuzila ilayhim. That we have sent down to you the reminder, meaning the Quran. To make it clear to the people that which has been sent to them. So the Messenger of Allah made clear. Then there is another part. A third category of the Sunnah as it relates to the Quran. Which is called the Sunnah Al-Istiqlaliyah. Which is the independent Sunnah. For which, for, for which a certain ruling or a certain matter. There is no mention of it. Neither in the Quran whatsoever. Like for example. For example. In the Quran there is no mention of the growing of the beard. And its obligation. In the Quran directly the beard is not mentioned. That you should grow it. And you must grow it. This is in the Sunnah. Likewise, the using of the siwak, that is from, that is recommended. It is not in the Quran, but it is in the Sunnah. Do we say now that we don't accept it because it's not in the Quran? No, rather we accept it, whether it's in the Quran or whether it's in the Sunnah. Why? Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam never spoke from his desires. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَى That he never spoke from his own desires, but rather it was revelation that was conveyed to him. So there are many things in the Sunnah that you don't that you find from the words of the Prophet Sallallahu that you won't find in the Quran. You won't find it in the Quran. Or if you find it in the Quran, you find the explanation of it in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu because that was the purpose or from the purposes of sending the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to clarify to the people that which Allah intended for them. To clarify to the people that which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala intended for them. So knowing all of that and realizing this fact that we know that the whole of our deen, the final reference point, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we don't argue with this whatsoever. There's no argument with regard to, uh, to, to two Muslims debating over this issue. We make the, make the origin of our faith, the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Quran as we mentioned. فَإِن تَنَازَتْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ That if you differ in any affair between yourselves, who? You the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Uh, the Sahaba. If you differ in any affair between yourselves, then refer it back to Allah and His Messenger. If you believe in Allah in the last day. Likewise for every generation that comes afterwards. If you differ in any affair between yourselves. فَإِن تَنَازَتْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ If they differ in any affair between themselves, then refer it back to Allah and His Messenger. If they truly believe in Allah and the last day. The companions implemented this. And those who came after them. From the Tabi'een, they, they implemented this. And then those who came after them from the Atbaw Tabi'een, 
and then the next generation the fourth generation and the fifth from those who were who ascribed themselves and clung to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in accordance to the statement of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sabiqun al awwalun min al muhajirin wal ansar wal ladhin attaba'uhum bi ihsan radiyallahu anhum wa radwan that the first and foremost to embrace Islam from the Muhajireen and from the Ansar, from the likes of those who migrated from the companions of Allah's Messenger وسلم, from Mecca all the way to Medina, and then from those Ansar who were already in Medina, and then those who follow them in goodness. Abdul Rahman al Saadi, rahimahullah ta'ala, from the Imams of this era, from the teachers of Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymeen, he mentions that this is a proof that those who come after. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they are likewise those whom Allah is pleased with. Why? For one reason and one reason only. The Messenger of Allah is not mentioned in this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mention himself in this ayah. Allah mentions the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the Muhajireen and the Ansar, and then those who follow them radiallahu anhum. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. Who? those who follow the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So, there is a group of people who come after the Sahaba, whom also Allah is pleased with. But Allah is pleased with them for the reason that Allah has mentioned, that they follow the Sahaba in goodness. Follow the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in goodness. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as he reported, by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu. He said, خَدْتَ لَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ خَدْتَ ثُمَّ قَالَ هَذَا سَبِيلُ اللَّهِ That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam drew for us a line. And after drawing for us a line, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, هَذَا سَبِيلُ اللَّهِ This is the path of Allah. He didn't say subal. He said, سَبِيلُ اللَّهِ It is the singular path of Allah. ثُمَّ خَدْتَ خَطُوتًا عَنْ يَمِينِهِ وَعَنْ شِمَالِهِ Then he drew lines to the right of it and then he drew lines to the left of it because it was خَدْتَ خَطُوتًا He drew lines, multiple lines to the right of the line of Allah, the path of Allah which is one line and he drew many lines to the right and lines to the left. And then he sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, هَذِهِ سُبُلٌ مُتَّفَرِّقَةٌ And then he said that these are divergent, differing paths. So the path of Allah is how many? One. Who drew it for us? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Permissible to disobey him? Abadan, never. Did he speak from his own desires? Never. So when he drew that line, he was inspired sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When he drew the line, he was inspired. When he said, هَذَا سَبِيلُ Allah, He was inspired. When he drew the lines to the right and the left, he was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the Messenger of Allah, this is why we believe, our aqeedah, ahlu sunnah wal jama'ah, that the wahi is, wah- is two types of wahi, the Qur'an and the sunnah. So when he was drawing that line, he was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he drew the lines to the right and the left, he was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he pointed towards those lines, to the right and to the left, and he said, هَذِهِ سُبُلُ الْمُتَّفَرِّقَةِ That these are paths which are diverging. Not one path. He used the plural, subul. That these are divergent paths. So those paths that are divergent, are they the paths of Allah? Never. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, عَلَى كُلِّ سَبِيلٍ مِنْهَا شَيْطَانٍ يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهِ That at the head of each one of those paths, there is a devil calling to it. So that establishes for us that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came with a singular path, not multiple paths. He came with one way, one sabil, and that is the sabil of Allah, and the sabil of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and that is the Sirat al Mustaqim. Because thereafter, the Messenger of Allah, after mentioning that there is a devil at the head of each one of those paths, then the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, he recited the verse in the Quran where Allah said, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبَلْ فَاتَّفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned the statement of Allah that this is the straight path of Allah. This is the straight path of Allah. So follow it. 
and do not follow the other paths for they will divide you or separate you away from his straight path from Allah's path so the path of Allah is one why because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi came with one being one religion for everyone to follow that one way and this is from the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it now possible because as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions that when one ponders even over these types of affairs that if one was to ponder over them just think about it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not oppress right never oppresses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah has mentioned in the Quran that he does not commit zulm upon anybody subhanahu wa ta'ala it is from the justice of Allah is it from the justice of Allah that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam would draw a line in the sun and draw lines to the right and the left and not explain how to stick to that straight path not possible not possible it is not in accordance with the justice of Allah that Allah wishes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes for us guidance and commands mankind to worship him and Allah has mentioned in the Quran at you Allah wa at you Rasul obey Allah and obey the messenger قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ Say to them, if they love Allah, then follow me. If Allah Jalla wa Ala has mentioned all of these things, but then He doesn't tell you how to follow the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's not possible. Not possible. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, if He makes a promise, and He commands you with something, then likewise He will show you how to do that thing that He has commanded you to do. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in a hadith, which is the hadith really that, that maybe this whole topic revolves around which is the hadith <coughs> of Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu the companion of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said that the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said taftariku hadhihi al-ummah <coughs> that this ummah will divide ala thalathin wa sab'ina firqa into 73 sects kulluhum fi nar illa wahida all of those sects will be into the hellfire except for one so they said, who said? The companion said, وَمَا هِيَ تِلْقَ الْفِرْقَى Which is this saved sect? So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ الْيَوْمْ وَأَصْحَابِي That which I and my companions are upon today. That is the saved sect, ya ikhwan. In a narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when he mentioned that the ummah would divide into 73 sects, he said, mentioning, the one that he saved, he said, وَهِيَ الْجَمَاعَى It is, the Jama'ah. In one narration, he said that which I and my companions are upon. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has clarified that if a person or an individual wants to know, first and foremost, that we understand that it is from the from, from the irada of Allah Kauniya that the Ummah will divide. It is from the universal will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that the Ummah will divide. Not that we are pleased with division. Not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with division. Because likewise it is from the irada of Allah kawniya. It is from the universal will of Allah that a certain number of mankind will worship idols. It is from the universal will of Allah that a certain number of mankind will partake in magic. And commit fornication and sins. Do we say that just because Allah has willed it from his universal will. That therefore Allah loves it and is pleased with it? No. Doesn't necessitate that. So we do not rejoice at the fact. We do not rejoice at the fact that Allah subha- that the ummah will divide. Rather, we say it is from the irada of Allah kawniya. It is from the universal will of Allah. Not that Allah is pleased with it. There is a wisdom behind it, and that wisdom is with Allah subhanahu wa taala to show the people of truth from the people of falsehood, from those who will have istiqama and uprightness, from those who will fall by the wayside. It is from the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for which Allah has created you for to see which of you are better in life and which of you are better in death. From the, from the tests of Allah, which one now? Out of no, after knowing that the ummah will divide into 73, all of them into the hellfire. And incidentally, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam will have more sectarianism within it than even the Jews and the Christians. Because in a narration of the hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, that the, indeed the Jews they divided into 71 and the Christians they divide into 72 my ummah will divide into 73 so there are more sects in Islam than even the Jews and the Christians but that doesn't mean 
that the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is not the best Ummah. It is still the best Ummah as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in the Quran. But nevertheless, the point here being that when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam informed us that the Ummah will divide all of them into their hellfire except for one, then the purpose of your creation, ya ikhwan, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the jinn Allah mentions, nor mankind except that they should worship me alone. After that worship, where do you enter? After worshipping Allah and obeying Allah. For what? For entering into His pleasure into the gardens of paradise. So that you may be with the company of the, of the Anbiya and the Rusul and the righteous. And that you may see the face of your Lord. So we protect ourselves from the hellfire by the worship of Allah. And we protect ourselves from the hellfire in whatever means we are able to do so. As the Prophet ﷺ said, save yourselves from the fire even if it be with giving a date or the skin of a date or the portion of a date in charity. Save yourselves even with the portion of a date. So now the Messenger of Allah has stated that the Ummah will divide all of them into the hellfire except for one. So are we not to protect ourselves from the hellfire? If we are to protect ourselves from the hellfire, we have to know how. And the ilm or the knowledge of knowing how to protect ourselves from the hellfire, from the, from the arena of division and, 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 the, and the multitude of groups and parties is an obligation upon us to know. Oblig- obligatory upon us to know how to protect ourselves from the hellfire and how to save ourselves from the hellfire. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu did not leave us blind and he did not leave us in the dark. But rather the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the saved sect, when they asked him, who is that, who is that, what is that one sect? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that which I and my companions are upon today. As the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam said. So the companions, of course, here play an important role. Allah also mentions them in the Quran in the ayah that we mentioned in Surah Tawbah. Also Allah mentions in another ayah, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ رَسُولًا مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَأْتَبِ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ مَسِيرًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that whomsoever opposes the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then after the guidance has been conveyed to him and then he chooses a path other than the path of the companions of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is the tafsir of the ayah that whoever chooses a path other than the path of the sahaba of the companions then Allah will leave him in the path that he has chosen and burn him in the hellfire and what an evil destination. Because the sabil of the mu'mineen is what? The sabil of the sahaba. Without doubt, the path of the believers is the path of the companions. Anyone who claims that there is a path of the believers which is other than the path of the companions is in a different planet. And he hasn't read the Quran. And nor does he understand the Quran. Nor does he understand the sunnah. That a person can say that you can be upon the path of the believers which is other than the path of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Why? Because of the ayah that I mentioned previously. When Allah, when Allah mentioned the first to embrace, uh, the first of those from the muhajireen and from the Ansar companions and then those who follow them in goodness, Allah is pleased with them. It's that path. And the same path that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. When he وسلم, was asked about the saved sect, he said, that which my, I and my companions are upon. This is the same path that is mentioned the in this ayah in Surah An-Nisa. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ رَسُولًا مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى That whomsoever opposes the messenger of Allah وسلم, after the guns has been conveyed to them, and then he chooses a path other than the path of the companions, the believers are the companions, because at the time of the revelation of the ayah, who were the believers? It was the Sahaba. It wasn't you and me. You and me weren't around. It wasn't Malik. It wasn't Shafi. It wasn't Ahmed. They weren't around. It wasn't Awzai and Sufyan and Zuhri and Muhammad ibn Sirin. Even though they are great illustrious Imams. And yes, they are upon the path of the believers. But they took the path of the first believers. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُحَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ The first and foremost from the from the Muhajirin and from the Ansar, meaning the Sahaba. It is that path that is mentioned in this ayah. So whomsoever opposes the Messenger of Allah, after the guidance has been conveyed to him, chooses a path other than the path of the companions, then Allah will leave him in the path that he has chosen and burn him in the hellfire. And what an evil destination. This is the distinguishing sign 
of the Salafiyun of this era and the people of Sunnah in every era. This is what distinguishes us. Every single other sect and group and party, whichever you name to me, every single one of them will oppose the Sabil of the Mu'mineen in one area or two areas. And then a person may say, well, if they oppose it in one, what's the big deal? What if they oppose it in one and they reject the Sunnah even in one issue, knowing it to be Sunnah, then they are not from Ahlul Sunnah. As Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, وَمِنَ السُنَّةِ لَازِمَةِ اللَّتِ مَنْ تَرَكَ مِنْهَا خَسْلَةً لَمْ يَقْبَلْهَا وَيُؤْمِنْ بِهَا لَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا That it is, necess- that it is, the, it is, it is a necessary binding or what the binding necessary sunnah necessitates is that whomsoever leaves a single portion of it then and does not believe in it then he has not believed in any of it and he is not from its people and Imam Ahmad clarifies that later in his Asul Sunnah when Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah ta'ala his Asul Sunnah mentions that, the, that these are hadith that come from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam related to the Qadr related to the Aqeedah related to the Sifat of Allah related to the Ru'ya or related to anything so long as they have reached us through the Riwayat from the Thiqat from the, from the narrators who are from the thiqat or from the authentic, trustworthy narrators, then we accept it. Even if the one who listens to it, he finds it despicable and adverse. We don't care. If it is the sunnah of Allah's Messenger وسلم, reported to us, then we accept it. All of it and completely without opposing it and without turning our backs upon it. All of the sunnah we accept it so long as we know it's authentic. This is the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So when those people of Bid'ah, like I was mentioning yesterday to some brothers, I mentioned to them that on an occasion I went to one of the shops on the commentary road in Birmingham. I walked in the shop, the brother said, he's, uh, the, the brother behind the counter, Arab brother, he said, listen, ach, you know these rulers, wallahi these rulers are so and so and so and so and so and so. That the rulers, they're the enemies of the religion. And we should topple them. And we should remove them. They are kuffar. They are there in the pockets of the United Nations. And they are Zionists and so on and so forth. I said, bas, 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 bas. I said, Akhi, you take on what is your responsibility and leave them to their responsibility. Make dua for their guidance. Even if they are tyrannical. Make dua for them. Even if they are oppressors or tyrannical. If they are righteous or pious. Because it's from the sunnah that you make dua for them. And this was from the way of the Salaf. And I said, Wallahi, just have patience. As the Prophet ﷺ said, have patience till you meet me at the hold. Till you meet me at the lake, meaning on the plains of the Day of Judgment, have patience till you meet me at the lake. So have patience, akhi. This was the, this was the, the mawqif of Anas ibn Malik when they came to him about Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. This was the position of Hassan al-Basri when they, came, when they came to him about Hajjaj ibn Yusuf who was an oppressor. He killed the Sahaba as Abdullah ibn Umar upon his deathbed when, when Hajjaj came to him. He said, what happened? He said, you killed me. Because they poisoned him. He said, you killed me. It was you. Don't deny it. So Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was a, was a dhalim, as Imam al-Dhahabi mentions. And also he crucified, he, he executed uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, the companion of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. But when they came to the companions, when they came to Ibn Umar, and they came to Anas ibn Malik, and they came to Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, be patient. Don't rebel. Don't go against him. Be patient. Because that which you are suffering, either it is a punishment from Allah, or it is a test from Allah. If it is a punishment from Allah, you're not going to remove your punishment with your swords. You're going to remove the you're going to pick up a sword and fight the punishment of Allah. And if it is a test, then be patient. Because no person is afflicted with the test except that if he is patient, then it is replaced with that which is better. No doubt. So I said to him, be patient, Akhi. And I said, look at the hadith of the Prophet. Prophet hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet said to Hudayfa that you will have rulers over you. And they will not follow my sunnah, and they will not follow my guidance, and they will, and some of them, they will have the hearts of devils. They will have the hearts of devils in the bodies of men. And Hudayfa said, "What should I do if I was to see that, or if I was to, if that was to come to me?" He said, "Hear and obey them, even if in 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 wa in maluk, even if your wealth is taken, and even if." You, or, or, even if your back is beaten and your wealth is taken even if they steal your wealth I said Akhi the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then again repeated to him be patient the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said hey don't obey so I said look they don't follow this number one the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Aimma, you're not going to have one ruler you're going to have many rulers who will do this 
They will not follow his sunnah. They will not follow his guidance. They will have the hearts of devils in the bodies of men. They will beat you in your back and they will take your wealth. I said, look, this is the messenger of Allah. And the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman. And there are numerous hadith which are similar wording to this. So I said, Akhi, just take the hadith. No. This hadith, it, it must be wrong. I said, it's in Sahih Muslim. He said, there must be some ta'wil. I said, what ta'wil? I said, how much clearer do you want the Prophet to be, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, no, no, this hadith, I can't, I can't accept it. Why? Because he puts the hadith to his desires. Puts the text of the kitab and the sunnah to his hawa. And I said, okay, take the books of aqidah of the salaf. Take Sharh uh, al-Sunnah uh, uh, of al-Barbahari. Take a sunnah of, uh, of uh, Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmed. Take a sunnah of al-Marwazi. Take sunnah of al-Khallal. I said, take usul al-Sunnah of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Take kitab al-Sharia of Imam al-Ajuri. I said, take, shar- take the aqaid that are contained, the books of, the, 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 the multiple narrations that are contained in the encyclopedia of aqidah. Sharh al-Sul al-Tiqad ahl sunnah wal jama'ah ibn al-Kai. I said, take uh, al-Sabunis, Imam al-Sabunis book. Aqidatu Salaf wa Ashabu al-Hadith. I said, all of them, they agree with this. He said, no, it's not possible. Not possible. I said, okay, what's the ta'wil? He said, maybe the hadith is mansukh. I said, maybe it is mansukh. I said, the events hadn't occurred yet. How is it mansukh? The Prophet ﷺ is talking about events that are going to occur. If something has occurred, and then time goes on, it's possible for that action that has occurred, that the Prophet ﷺ later would abrogate it. Possible. Allah would abrogate it. Like, for example, the, 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 the abrogation with regard to the ayat related to alcohol. Uh, related to the drinking of khamar. In the early part of Islam, the, the companions were allowed. Latter part of Islam, they were discouraged. The final part of Islam, forbidden. Why? Because these three stages occurred. I said, none of this has occurred. So why are you going to abrogate that which hasn't occurred? He goes, there must be something. Must be something. I said, yes, there is something. The something is that you're not accepting the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So I said, you should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regard to the affairs of the deen. So the, the specific characteristic of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that Ahlu Sunnah accept the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa upon the understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Ikhwan, just look at the beginning of a Sulu Sunnah of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. After bringing the chain of narration, and the chain of narration which Qal uh, al-Qadi Abu Hussein Muhammad ibn Abi Ya'la, that the whole chain of narration that goes back to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Qara'tu ala al-Mubarak. That he said to uh, al-Mubarak. That he mentioned haddathna Abdul Aziz al-Azji. And then eventually he reaches the stage where he says haddathni. The narrator says haddathni Abdus bin Malik al-Atar. Sama'tu Aba Abdullahi Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Radiyallahu anhu yaqul. So now you have a chain of narration. Going back to Ahmad ibn Hanbal. In which Abdus bin Malik al-Atar said. That he said that I heard Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal radiallahu anhu, meaning this great Imam, born in the year 164, died in the year 241 after the Hijrah. That Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, that he said, Usulu sunnati indana, that the fundamental principles of the sunnah with us are. So now he's bringing the usul. He's bringing those matters that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were upon. And those matters which the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did not differ upon. Because these are the usul. When we refer to the usul, then, the aqid, then what we're referring to is the aqidah and the manhaj. We are, recur- we are referring to the belief of Ahlul Sunnah. Or the creed of Ahlul Sunnah. Meaning the creed of the Sahaba. The creed of the companions. And the creed of the, the, the earliest, the, this earliest generation. The first generation of Muslims. The Sahaba and their methodology. That which they were upon. These were gathered in the books of Aqidah and the books of Sunnah. And some of those books are given, as Shaykh Al-Fawzan mentions, they were given the term Sunnah, like Sharh Al-Sunnah, Barbahari, Usul Al-Sunnah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Sarih Al-Sunnah, Wa Tabari, Al-Sunnah, Wa Al-Khallal, Al-Sunnah, Wa Al-Marwazi, Al-Sunnah, Wa Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmad. These were all terms, the term that is used is Sunnah. Shaykh Al-Fawzan said, but when you open these books, they're not dealing with fiqh. As the, as the common person thinks today, they don't deal with fiqh. What they're dealing with is the usul, the foundations and the fundamentals of the religion that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did not differ upon. That's what they're dealing with. And they will cover issues such as Qadr, the pre-decree. They will cover issues such as, for example, the Iman 
and the belief of Ahlul Sunnah with regard to Iman. That Iman is speech and action. And it increases and it decreases. It is speech of the heart, speech of the tongue, action of the heart, action of the limbs. It increases with obedience to Allah, decreases with disobedience to Allah. In all of the books of Aqeedah, in all these books which are titled as Sunnah. And likewise you'll find also other issues such as Allah, the attributes of Allah, the, fa- the seeing of Allah, Yawmul Qiyamah, the bridge over the hellfire, the punishment in the grave, the, the questioning in the grave. They will cover also other issues that are not related to the unseen, but are also part of the usul, such as for example the position of the Sahaba towards Ahlul Bida. Mention these books of Aqeedah. The position of Ahlul Sunnah towards the people of Bida. That we do not relate to them, and we do not go to them, and we do not take knowledge from them, and we do not take our deen from them. Rather we abandon them, and we keep away from them. These books contain that kind of speech. Go to Sharh al-Sunnah, Usul al-Sunnah, al-Sunnah, even Kitab al-Shariya of Imam al-Ajuri. Go to Sharh al-Sul al-Tiqad al-Sunnah of Allah al-Kai. All of this you find in those works and in those books of Aqaid, in those books of Creed, which are titled either Sunnah or Shariya or something similar to that. But also you find in there things that are not related to the unseen, such as our position with regard to the rulers. Do not rebel against the Muslim rulers, whether he be righteous or whether he be... Uh, tyrannical no rebellion against him it is impermissible to, to raise the sword against them and we should not sit with Ahlul Bid'ah and we do not and, and we do not uh, that, that we hate the, the people of Bid'ah those who curse the companions from the Rafida and those who rebel against the Muslim rulers and declare them to be Kuffar and we are not with the Khawarij who declare people to be uh, Kuffar due to the sins that they commit and we are not with them this is the this is the Aqeedah in those books of Aqeedah that it contains clarifying who the saved sect are. What did I say at the beginning? That there is a group of individuals alive today. And that is maybe Allahu A'lam, the majority of the people, the majority of the Ummah. That they believe that no one knows what the saved sect is. But by Allah, this phenomenon of claiming that no one knows who the saved sect is a newly invented phenomenon, a bid'ah of this era. And a bid'ah that has been pushed through. From the Hizbi, CRC organizations, such as Ikhwan al-Muslimin. Why? Because they wish to gather behind their banner all of the innovators. So to gather all of the innovators, you can't attack them. They're part of you now. So Ikhwan al-Muslimin will gather the Ash'ari, the Jahmi, the Mu'tazili, the Sufi, the Quburi, grave worshipping Brailwi, Qadri, Chisti, Saharwardi. All of them will be gathered together into one organization. Why? Because these things that they have by way of their aqidah, which is a false, corrupted belief that they hold all of these types of organizations, but they will gather together for one purpose, and that purpose being a political goal in gaining the seat of power. So you find this. Likewise, you find the same, same thing with jamaat islami in Pakistan. That is, we don't restrict anyone from becoming a member of our organization, so long as they believe in the goals of the organization. Forget about the goals of the sharia. And the Aqeedah and the books of the Salaf. It is the goals of the organization. So now, and likewise you find it with other groups. Groups in this country, same thing. Whether it be ISB or MCB or any of these groupings. Same methodology, Islamic foundation, same manhaj. That if you believe, uh, Hizb al-Tahrir and all, all of these types of groupings. What Aqeedah and what belief you hold individually. Whether you call upon the messenger Muhammad or Ali or Hussein or Ali. Or whether you call upon Fatima, whether you call upon Badawi, or whether you call upon Abdul Qadir Jilani, makes not one dot of a difference. So long as you believe that the Khilafah is the greatest goal of the Muslim. Doesn't make no difference. Shi'i, Rafidi, doesn't matter. So now these organizations, how do they, how do they overcome this mentality that the Muslims have? But we thought that the same sect was one. But you gather between all of the sects. They say, no, 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 you see... No one knows who the saved sect is. So then they propagate this amongst the people. So much so, I'll visit relatives and they say, Yeah, yeah, but you talk about this. But no one really knows, brother. You know no one knows. I say, no, what are you talking about? No one knows. What do you mean no one knows? People knew. Well, Imam Ahmed didn't know. Bin Hanbal. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, didn't know. Imam Shafi didn't know. Sufyan al-Thawri didn't know. They didn't know those illustrious Imams. Al-Hassan al-Basri, who died in 110, didn't know. Umar bin Abdul Aziz died 104 after the Hijrah, didn't know. Muhammad ibn Sirin didn't know. Imam al Zuhri died in 124, he didn't know. All of those Tabi'een who studied under the Sahaba, they didn't know. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who didn't meet the Sahaba, but he didn't know. 
Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he didn't know. Abdul Ghani Al Maqdasi, he didn't know. Imam Al Barbahari, he didn't know. Imam Al Bukhari died 256 after the Hijrah. He didn't know who the safe sect were. What was he doing then? What were they calling to then? Huh? Why were they refuting the Mu'tazila? Because if you look at the statement of Imam Al Bukhari, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Imam Bukhari is collected by Imam Al Alaka in Sharf Sul Ittiqad. He mentions a statement from Imam, Imam Al Bukhari, the great Imam, the compiler of, this, of what we commonly call today the Sahih of Imam Al Bukhari. Huh? That he mentions that Imam Al Bukhari said that I sought hadith or I sought knowledge and I traveled in search of knowledge for 46 years. And then he mentions the various lands that he, meant, that he went to. And remember, there's no airplanes, no planes, no cars, none of this. Either, either horseback, camelback, donkeyback, or foot. That's what he's doing. He's traveling from Bukhara in the southern steppes of Russia. Huh? And he's going to places like Mecca and Medina and Yemen and Sham, Palestine, and uh, what is modern day Palestine. And Jordan, modern day Jordan, and to Egypt, and he's going to the Najd, and he's going to Iraq. 46 years, and he said, I met over a thousand scholars. Over a thousand scholars he took from. This is Imam al Bukhari. That's why there's no, it's, it's no small reason why they call him the Amir al Mu'mineen fil Hadith, the leader of the believers as it relates to Hadith. No, there's, not, there's, no, there's no small reason why they call There's a reason why they call him that, and that's the reason. And he said, By Allah, not a single one of them over the 46 years differed in the following matters. Then Imam, Imam Al-Alakai collects those matters that he mentions. And in each one of those matters, he refutes one of the groups of Bid'ah. First one, he refutes the Murjia. Second one, he refutes the, second one, refutes the, uh, the Shia. Then he refutes the uh, Qadariya. Then he refutes the Khawarij. One by one, he refutes all of them. They did not differ. Why? Because they knew that these, these groups and these sects will op oppose the Quran and the Sunnah and they oppose the way of the saved sect. Those groups and their mentality is present today. The names may have changed, but the person is the same. The ideology is the same. Like uh, and the example I'm sure all of you know that I keep using every time I do a talk, we have this bottle of Evian natural mineral water. I peel off that label and I put onto it Carling Black label. Huh? Lager. Is what is inside of this different or has the label changed? Just the label that has changed. And that's the reality of what's happening with these organizations and groupings. The reality is that they have the ideas of the Mu'tazila who put the intellect, like that man that I was talking to you about in Birmingham, he puts the intellect over the following of the book and the sunnah. Why? Because his emotions are so strong that he can't control them anymore. Even if the, mess the words of the messenger are given to him, no, we have to deal with the rulers. No, I don't care. We have to deal with the rulers. Hadith in Muslim, no, we have to deal with the rulers. Hadith in Bukhari, no, we have to deal with the rulers. So the emotions become so attached to rebelliousness and to the emotions that are connected because of what he has been called to and what he sees and what he watches that now he's drowned in his emotions so now the kitab and the sunnah it doesn't mean anything to him anymore he says that he loves it because no muslim is going to say i don't love the quran and i don't love the sunnah i don't love allah and i don't love his messenger no muslim would say that but they find it so difficult to implement it why because those ideologies of old of the mu'tazila or the khawarij who believe that you can rebel against the muslim ruler or the shia who cursed the companions of Allah's Messenger, whom Allah said that He is pleased with, and He will enter them into the gardens of paradise. And Allah's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stage, whoever does not follow them, Allah will burn them in the hellfire. They say they are kuffar. That's the Shia, Aqeedah of the Shia, the Rafida. That's the Aqeedah. Abu Bakr is a kafir, Umar is a kafir, Uthman is a kafir, Aisha is a whore, the wife of the Prophet. This is the Aqeedah. I'm not making it up. This is the Aqeedah. This is the Aqeedah of the, of the Rafida. So this is what they do. Now these organizations of the 20th century or in the 21st century or 15th century Hijri 1428 these organizations that we find today politically based organizations Ikhwan al-Muslimin or jamaat e islami of, Ikhwan al-Muslimin of Egypt jamaat e islami of Pakistan huh, or India and likewise organizations such as the Jamiat al-Islah 
uh, that is present in Yemen and present in the Gulf, which is another brand of Ikhwan, Ikhwaniya. Likewise, Ihya Turath al Islami. These organizations, they bring a front in front of you. And because they have certain goals and certain places that they need to reach, they have to hide the fact that they are polit or they, they are ideologies out there that oppose the way of the Sahaba. And by Allah, the mushkila that we have and the problem that we have is that the majority of the Muslims who wish to be active in Islam, meaning that they wish to practice their Islam, that they believe the thing that or, or those affairs that they are being fed with. They believe them. So now when the Salafi comes, the Sunni comes, the Athari comes to them. The person of Sunnah and Salafi, he says to him, Ya Akhi, Wallahi, the way of the Sahaba is one. Ikhwan and Muslimin gather between all of the innovative groups. Jamaat Islami gather between these innovative groups. Jamaat al Tabligh don't give, don't, couldn't give one hoot about anything to do with the Tawheed and the Aqeedah. That's why they never talk about Tawheed. They never talk about Tawheed of Uluhiyya or Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat. Why? Because they regard these affairs of Aqeedah to be affairs that cause friction and fitna. So they won't talk about the most important matter. So we say to them, Ya Ikhwan, that the affair in reality is that the thing that distinguishes us, that makes the saved sect the saved sect, is the following of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in their understanding of the Nusus, in their understanding of the text of the book and the Sunnah. This is what makes the saved sect the saved sect, which is different to everybody else. The Hizb tahrir greatest goal of Hizb tahrir is what? I mean, I could ask probably the most, the, the, the newest person from amongst you. If you know of the organization Hizb tahrir what's their goal? Khilafah. That's their goal, that's what they claim. What was the goal of the prophets and the messengers? Tawheed. The first command in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas, Allah. Huh? Oh, ya ayyuhan nas, u'budu rabbakum. That the first, oh, oh mankind, worship your guardian Lord. The one who has created you. And, though, and created those who came before you, so that you may become muttaqoon. That you may attain taqwa. First command of the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses mankind with ibadah. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions with regard to the prophets that they were sent to establish the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say khilafa. Have they now agreed with the Sahaba or disagreed with the Sahaba? Disagreed. Now, we take, a, we take a Hizb al-Tahrir or other groups similar to this with the Mu'tazili ideas. All of them, if you take them one by one, same thing. Same thing. The goal of Jamaat al-Takfir, rebellion against the rulers. What's the, what's the position of the Sunnah? Not permissible to rebel against the Muslim rulers. Their position, you must rebel. And if you don't rebel, you'll like them and you should be killed like they should be killed. Huh? This is, the, is this the way of the Sunnah in accordance to the hadith that we mentioned? Never. Going back to what Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said. He said, Usulu sunnati indana. These are the usul, as, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, that, that if one looks at the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and one looks at the Sahaba, then one will find that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum never ever differed as it relates to the usul and the qawaid of Ahl sunnah that they never differed in the qawaid of al-Islam, ever. The statement of Shaykh al-Islam in volume 6 of Minhaj al-Sunnah, that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum never differed in the usul, any asl from the usul, or any qaida from the qawaid of al-Islam, the Sahaba never differed in the fundamental principles. And they never fought each other due to a differing of the fundamental principles. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum never differed in the sifat of Allah, nor in the issue of qadr. Never differed. They never differed in the issue of the khawarij. Look when Abdullah ibn Abbas went to the khawarij. What did he say to them? One of the first things that Abdullah ibn Abbas said to the Khawarij, and there were approximately 20,000 of them who were camped outside. Uh, they wanted to be outside of the rule of Ali. So they were camped. And Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, he went to them to debate with them and to correct them. After they had said that Ali radiallahu anhu is a kafir, they said to Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu they said, Kad kafarta. That you have disbelieved. They said it to Ali radiallahu anhu. Abu Nabas said, okay, I'll go to them. So he went to them. And he looked. And when he reached them, he looked around them. And he said, by Allah, I've come from a group of people amongst whom the Quran was sent down. Amongst whom the Quran was sent down. And I do not see a single one of them amongst you. 
Not one Sahabi amongst those 20,000. They couldn't convince a single companion to join them. Look at them. Now anyone who's sitting there, imagine, may Allah protect us ever from falling into any of these types of uh, khurafat and inhiraf and bid'a. May Allah protect us and protect our families. Because the hearts, ya ikhwan, wallahi the hearts are weak. And how many people in our lifetimes, in the da'wah, the, in, the, in the period of time that we've been giving da'wah, that they have dropped off from one side and the other side. Brothers that we used to love and respect and honor, used to stand next to us, foot to foot, shoulder to shoulder, for years. One day you come to the masjid, disappeared. Where is he gone? He's gone and joined that group or this group. Or he, he fell, you know, he, he fell prey to them because he started debating with them. And then they threw shubahat at them and now he's gone. So may Allah protect our hearts from this type of weakness. Because the hearts are between the two fingers of Ar-Rahman, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah turns them whichever way He wishes. But if a person was sitting there in Aqil, amongst those 20,000, as soon as a companion of Allah's Messenger, he mentions Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, I've come from a group of people amongst whom the Qur'an was sent down. And I do not see a single one of them. For me, that will be enough to say, you know what, I'm off. I'm going to Ali, making Tawbah, this issue, that's it. I don't need to hear anything else. That's what you would imagine. Uh, anyone with any intellect or intelligence with the atom's weight of decency would say that. Here we have the companions who the Prophet ﷺ loved. Allah loves them. Allah has promised them Jannah. And you are sitting here and, and you're looking around you, 20,000 of you people sitting there, Johal, don't know nothing, never heard, never saw the messenger's face, never mind heard a statement from him. And you're claiming that you know better than them? Impossible. Impossible. I remember years ago, years ago, it must have been going right back to 1995 or 96, Muhammad al-Mas'ari, this shaitan, Khabith, who puts uh, on, his, on his website, he allows the posting of the beheading of, you know, of, of contractors in Iraq and this place and that place. Uh, and he appeared in court because of this. And for some reason they released him. Allahu alam why. Why they released him. I remember on one occasion someone said, you know, this guy's here. Why don't you just send him something? Just by way of a letter, by explaining to him the Aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah. Maybe, maybe he hasn't heard it before, unlikely, but you never know. Maybe he hasn't heard it before. Send him some Adilla, some proofs and whatever. Mention to him that. So I said, okay, I'll compile something. Must have been about eight pages. About the Sahaba and sticking to the Sahaba and the way of the Sahaba wasn't like that. The way of the Sahaba wasn't like that. And the Prophet Sallallahu you know, he said, Khairun Nas Qarni, Thumma Ladina Yalunahum, Thumma Ladina Yalunahum, that the best of mankind is my generation, then those who come after them, and then those who come after them. So, so I, met, I put something together, I mentioned something about the Khair, sent it to him. His response, he said, we don't follow the Sahaba. One of the earliest things he said, you, you Wahhabis, government, this, government, that. Mention, I didn't mention anything to him about government at all. I deliberately left the issue. I stuck to the, to the, to the statements of old. Imam Ahmed, the Sahaba, how they were. That's what I stuck to. First thing he writes back, we don't follow the Sahaba. The Quran is enough. And any hadith that I find, that is enough. And I thought to myself, that is your illness. Because that is not enough. If that was enough, Allah would not have revealed those ayat. And the Prophet ﷺ would not have said in the hadith, the famous hadith, where the Messenger of Allah ﷺ gave a sermon. And the, and Irba, the narration of Irbad ibn Usariya. Incidentally, Shaykh Ubaid uh, gave a khutbah upon this and our brother Abdul Ilah translated it, put it back to the Shaykh and added some more notes to it. And that book, inshallah, should be published fairly soon. And the hadith is a beautiful hadith explained by Shaykh Ubaid. But anyway, in this hadith, Irbad ibn Usariya, radiyallahu anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa gave us a sermon. The sermon, that he gave us a sermon so much so that our eyes shed tears and our hearts trembled. Due to the sermon that he had given. So we went, so we thought that maybe this is the final sermon of the Messenger of Allah. It was as if it was a farewell sermon that he was about to leave us. So we went to him and we said to him, Ya Rasulullah, uh, Ya Rasulullah, it is as if you are about to leave us. So give us some advice. So what do you advise us with? So the Prophet said, Qad taraktukum ala al bayda. Layliha ka nahariha. لَا يَزِيغُ أَنْهَ بَعْدِ إِلَّا حالك. That the Prophet ﷺ said that indeed I have left you upon clear proof. It's night is like it's day, night is like it's day, and no one strays from it except that he is destroyed. Uh, this is what the Prophet ﷺ left us upon. There's no two ways about that, and there's no doubt about that in the mind of any Muslim. Then he said, 
And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَمَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسِيَارَ اِخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا That whomsoever from amongst you lives for long, then indeed he will see much differing and separation. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا عَرَفْتُمْ مِنْ سُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَخُلَفَاءُ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَحْدِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that whomsoever from amongst you lives for long, then he will see great differing. So stick to that which you know of my sunnah. Did he stop there? He said, and then the, and then the sunnah of those rightly guided successors after me. Abu Bakr. The Khulafa al rashidin who? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. The Prophet Sallallahu could have said, just stick to my sunnah, you'll be alright. But he said, stick to my sunnah. Huh? فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا عَرَفْتُمْ مِنْ سُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِينَ Stick to that which you know of my sunnah. And the sunnah of the rightly guided successors after me. And then he said, Abdu alayha bin nawajid. Hold on to that with your molar teeth. Another benefit that Shaykh Falah bin Ismail, Hafidhahullahu ta'ala, that you know, a number of times I've read this hadith, but it never occurred to me what he said. He said, look what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, hold it with your molar teeth. Of course, we've all heard why the molar teeth, because the molar teeth are the strongest teeth in your jaw. You grab it with something right at the back of your teeth, you're not going to let it go. You put it on the front, pull it, it'll be gone. Molar teeth is going to be a bit more difficult. But the Prophet ﷺ said, Abdu alayha. He said, hold on to it. Even though he mentioned, follow my sunnah and the sunnah of my successors after me. How many sunnahs? Two. But why did he say, hold on to it? One. Because there is no distinction between the sunnah of the Prophet and the sunnah of the Sahaba. It is one and the same. That's why he said, Abdu alayha, not alayhima. He never said hold on to two of them or both of them. He said hold on to one of them or hold on to it. Meaning his sunnah and the sunnah of his sahaba is one and the same thing. Abdu alayha bin nawajid. Hold on to it with your molar teeth. <coughs> so the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the way of the sahaba that came or the, and the sunnah of the sahaba that came after him. Imam Ahmed mentions Rasulul Sunnati Indana, the first point. The fundamental principles of the Sunnah with us are what? At-tamassaku bima kana alayhi ashabu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't mention the Messenger of Allah. He didn't mention the, the, uh, anybody else. He didn't mention the Book of Allah. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, can the brothers who are talking? Jazakumullah khairan. I'll be finished soon, inshallah. <laughs> Jazakumullah khairan. But... The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Usul sunnah He said Usul sunnati indana That the fundamental principles of the sunnah with us With who? With Imam Ahmad And his companions Who are his companions? The likes of Imam Shafi'i Who was his teacher And then his student And the likes of uh, Ishaq ibn Rahawai Ali al-Madini Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi huh? From the likes of Imam al-Bukhari From the likes of the, uh, of the rest of the ulama of his time. Uh, that, you know, so many, many of their names slip my mind. But nevertheless, the ulama of his time, those who he studied under, those who he taught. He said that the fundamental principles of the sunnah with us, us, the imams of Ahlul Sunnah, of old, those who knew the deen better than any of us sitting here today can dream of knowing. Uh, that even the likes of Sheikh bin Baz are in need of them. Uh, Rahimahullah was in need of them. And Sheikh Al-Albani, and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, and Sheikh Muqbil, and the rest of the ulama, those of them who are alive, the likes of Sheikh Al-Fawzan, teaches the books of the early Salaf. Like he's taught Barbahari, Sharh Sunnah Barbahari. And he's taught the books of Aqeedah. And Sheikh Ubaid likewise, teaching these books. Uh, as sunnah of the two Razis. Abu Zura and Abu Hatim al-Razi. These are, the, these are the ulama that our ulama refer back to. That we are in need of them. Our ulama are in need of them. Sheikh bin Baz was in need of them. Ibn Uthaymeen was in need of them. Sheikh Fawzan is in need of them. Sheikh Rabi is in need of them. That they go back to them and they study them and they learn what they were upon and adhere to it and teach us to be upon that. Those Imams, so when Imam Ahmed said, Usul Sunnati Indana, don't take it for granted. Oh, this is just Imam Ahmed's own personal opinion. No, this is the Usul of the Deen. 
And the first thing that he says, أَتَّمَسَّكُوا بِمَا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ أَصْحَابُ رُسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَالْإِقْتِدَاءُ بِهِمْ that we, had, that we hold fast to that which the companions of Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم were upon and to take them as a model or an example to be followed اِقْتِدَاءُ بِهِمْ to take them as a model to be followed to make iqtida of them they are our example وَالْتَرْكُ bid'a. And then, look, look how he begins his Asulu Sunnah, right at the very beginning, clarifying that the fundamental principles of the Sunnah with us, the compa- to follow the way, to, uh, ho- uh, to hold fast to the way of the companions of Allah's Messenger, to take them as an example to be followed, and to abandon their innovations. وَكُلُّ بِدَةٍ فَهِيَ dalala. For every innovation, it is misguidance. That's why he said, وَتَرْكُ khusumat, And we don't argue regarding this affair. Shuf! We don't argue, no, no, we're not going to argue with no one regarding this. This is what we are upon. You see, Imam Ahmed, look at the firmness. Not like a leaf in the wind, like we find many of the people today. Wind's blowing that way, I'll go that way. Wind blowing that way, I'll go that way. No, this wasn't the way of the early Salaf. They knew the saved sect. Like when Imam Ahmed was asked, who is the saved sect? He said, if it's not Ahlul Hadith, I don't know who they are. It is the people of Hadith. It is the way of the Salaf. It is the way of the Sahaba. They are the same sect as the scholars throughout history have clarified. Only these modernist, modern day political groups who wish to rock the thrones. Huh? They say, you people, you combat, you talk, you, you combat the shirk of the Qabur. As for us, we combat the shirk of the Qusur. Huh? We combat, they say that you Wahhabis, Salafis, that's what they call us. You fight against the shirk that is complete, committed at the graves. As for us, then we are more noble than that. We combat the shirk of the palaces. And look at the evil of their speech. When you, when you see the words of Imam Ahmed, and Imam Ahmed, he mentions, in his Asunah Sunnah, not permissible to raise the sword against the Muslim ruler, even if he's a fajr, even if he gained power by killing the one who was in charge. The one who was in charge, he murdered him. Killed him, buried his body, or put a or, 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 or put a carpet over his body and established his throne upon that. Even this is how he gained power by revolution. That because he wanted his kabila to be in charge. Like what Banu Abbas did to Banu Umayya in the early part of Islam. After the companions. That's what they did. They annihilated and killed the family of Banu Umayya and they took charge. Even if they gained power by force. So long as they gain the apparatus of government, then we give them the bay'ah and we give them the obedience. That's why Imam Ahmed said, and we do not rebel against them. No matter how much we find it detestful, we do not rebel against them. This was the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah. So he mentions, وَتَرْكُوا bid'ah. So we follow the Sahaba, take them as an example, abandon innovations. We don't follow deviations, for every innovation is misguidance. And then he said, وَتَرْكُوا khusumat." وَتَرْكُ الْجُلُوسِ مَا أَصْحَابِ الْأَحْوَى And we do not sit with the person of desires. Don't sit with them. Because they will take you to one of the 72 sects. They will take you outside of what you're upon. Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi in his explanation of Rasulullah Sunnah, he mentions, Wallahi ya ikhwan, don't argue. Don't fall into munadarat and debating with these people. For indeed they may throw a doubt at you. And you think that you are upon yaqeen. And you are upon certainty. And you are upon iman. And then when they throw the doubt upon you, they shake you. Look what Muhammad ibn Sirin, when the people came to him. And they said to him, we wish to debate with you. He said, I'm not going to debate with you. Muhammad ibn Sirin, ya ikhwan. Sat with the sahaba radiallahu anhum. If, 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 If not dozens, or if not hundreds, at least dozens of Sahaba radiallahu anhum that he sat with and took knowledge from. Some of the people of deviation wanted to debate with him. He said, no, I don't want to debate with you. They said, then let us recite the Quran. He said, either you're going to get up and leave or I'm going to go. You're not going to recite nothing to me. So they left. So some of the students of Muhammad ibn Sirin, they said, what harm would they have done if they recited the Quran? He said, they may have recited the Quran and twisted it. And it may have entered my heart and caused deviation. This is an imam of the sunnah doesn't want to listen to them. 
and we find our brothers want to lend an ear to them, let me just see what he's got to say. Let me just see what Hamza Yusuf has got to say. Let me just see what Nuhamim Kel has got to say. Let me just see what Abu Hamza al-Masri al-Kharaji al-Takfiri has to say. Let me just say what this one has got to say. Let me see what Abu Qatada has got to say. No, you don't need to hear what they've got to say. What is sufficient for you is the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet and that which the ulama have clarified for you. That is sufficient for you. Don't waste your time with them because they will rock your religion and they will shake your religion. So don't do that. That's why he said, وَتَرْكُ khusumat." After mentioning that we follow the Sahaba and we abandon innovations and then he mentions وَتَرْكُ khusumat" As an asal of the deen. That we don't argue with regard to this affair. It is our deen. We don't want to argue with you about it. Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. That's what we're dealing with. If you're happy, join us. I'm not going to argue with you about it. If you want knowledge about it, go to the circle of so and so. Alhamdulillah now in Salah, in, uh, sorry, in uh, Hounslow in Cranford, in this Masjid al-Sunnah, we have our brother Nadim, Abu Ishaq Nadim, whom I've known for well over a decade, at least since 1994-95. The man has graduated from Medina. He is here now for the summer. He does durus here. Benefit from his durus. Benefit from his durus. Our brother Abdul Ila, he's here for the summer. And they have nishat all the way through the summer. They have activities. If they have durus, come to those durus, benefit from them. When they do links with Sheikh Ubaid, or they, or, or they do links with some of the other mashaykh, come and sit in those links. That is sufficient for you. You don't need nobody else outside. Meaning that you don't need Ahlul Bida outside. I don't want no one walking out of here and saying, oh, he's calling to a hizb. No. Meaning that you don't need none of the people of Bid'a. If you know of someone else of Sunnah, who is known to be a person of Sunnah, and he has a connection with the scholars like Sheikh Rabi and Sheikh Al-Fawzan, and other than them from Ahlul Ilm, like Sheikh Ubaid, and Sheikh Ahmed Al-Najmi, and Zayd Al-Madkhali, and other Abdullah Al-Ghudayan, then go to them likewise. So long as that link is there, and you know that they are known for defending and loving the Sunnah, and being with their brothers upon the Sunnah, this is our way. So the saved sect, Ya Ikhwan, is not just a matter of me just giving you three sentences, and saying saved sect, this is it. it is the, yes, it is the Salafis. Not to say, that I'm going to single out any Salafi, like Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin who is asked, who is the safe sect? He said they are the Salafiyun. They are not the Ashairah. They are not the Mu'tazila. They are not the Qadariyah. They are not the Rafida Shia. They are not the Khawarij. They are the Salafiyun. This is what Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin said in his Aqidatul Wasitiyah. Clearly states it. It is, it, was, it is the Salafiyun. So it is the Salafiyun. But now, when we say it is the Salafiyun, it doesn't mean that I can single out any individual and say, you are in Jannah, you are in Jannah, you are in Jannah. No. As we mentioned at the beginning, rather we strive and we work and we, we make sure we follow the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to the best of our ability. And we'll conclude there, even though, you know, much more could be said, but inshallah, I think I'll conclude there. Jazakumullahu khairan. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.